Hi, my name's Sam Illingworth and I'm a senior lecturer in science communication here at the University of Western Australia and UWA would like to welcome you all to our first session of this webinar series which we have called Science Exchange. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr Talitha Santini is a senior lecturer in environmental science in the School of Agriculture and Environment at the University of Western Australia. She's a soil scientist by training and her research interests include environmental rehabilitation, geochemistry, microbiology and mineral processing. Her mining industry research over the last decade has been supported by partnerships with BHP, Rio Tinto, South 32, Newmount, Anglo Gold, Ashanti, Alcoa and the International Aluminum Institute, among others, delivering rapid, low cost strategies for tailings and wastewater reclamation and reuse to improve environmental management. She completed a PhD here at UWA before traveling to Canada to complete a postdoctoral fellowship and then accepted a position at the University of Queensland where she worked for five years before returning to Perth and UWA. You can find uh, Talitha on Twitter at Talitha underscore Santini and we aren't expecting you to have any specialist training or experience in mining. Talitha has promised only one chemical equation today which will be Oh no, I snuck another one in there. <laughs> okay, that's one. fine, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, and you know, you can have a, you're really going to enjoy yourselves here. So please, without further ado, Talitha, take it away. Thanks, Sam. So I thought I'd start today uh, with this photo. This is a photo from a lithium mine site in WA Southwest. Um, and we took a class that I teach in third year uh, land rehabilitation. Um, so some environmental science students uh, down here as part of a week-long field course last year and for them and probably for a lot of you today it was their first time that they'd gotten to see a mine site um, obviously with the restrictions at the moment we can't go there um, right now and see it firsthand um, but hopefully what you're going to get out of uh, this talk today is some of the things that they learned um, uh, on this field trip as well so being able to understand how uh, various different mine wastes and byproducts are generated what kinds of potential environmental impacts come with those and what we're doing um, to improve the remediation and reuse of these materials. So I'm going to save you the bus ride, um, the bus rides, uh, and take you on a visual journey uh, today through all of those different topics. And I'm hoping that you'll come away with a better understanding um, of what we're doing to uh, mitigate and minimise uh, issues with mining byproducts um, and some of the exciting uh, research uh, that's being done here at UWA to advance that. As Sam said, I'm not expecting any uh, background with the mining industry. We're gonna start by um, looking at how these different products are generated and then build on uh, from there. This is a photo of a, a very famous mine site in Queensland, uh, Mount Morgan. And this was one of the richest gold and copper deposits uh, that's ever been mined uh, in Australia and, and globally as well. Um, and I want to start on this slide because it shows some of the long-term consequences of failing to plan ahead when we open and operate new mining areas. This mine started in the late 1800s and obviously um, environmental regulations at that time weren't what they are today. Um, something like this just wouldn't happen today. Uh, but also our knowledge of the materials that we're producing, their chemistry, their reactivity, and different kinds of treatments that we can apply to uh, mitigate environmental impacts has changed over that period as well. Um, and unfortunately, this site is not the only one uh, worldwide. We continue to extract um, and refine various different mineral resources every year. Um, and with that comes environmental impacts. And today I'm really gonna focus on the land and water impacts. Um, so mining and quarrying activities have disturbed about 0.3% of Earth's uh, ice-free land surface area, and that equates to around 400,000 square kilometres. That's the disturbance caused by the mining activities themselves. About another million square kilometres are covered or storage areas for various kinds of mine waste, some of which you can see in this photograph. So um, there's some waste rock piles in the background and there's um, some smelting slag in the foreground there. And as I said, this area is going to continue uh, to increase as our global population grows and as our ore grades. So that is the uh, purity of these different uh, ores that we're extract extracting continue to decrease over time. Uh, as humans tend to do, we've gone for the easy high value stuff first. And a lot of the resources that are left now are much lower concentration 
than some of those materials that we were able to extract from in the past. Um, and so necessarily that generates more waste and byproducts in the course of mining and refining. Why is this important? Well, this is a particularly important problem to Australia because of the contribution that mining makes to our economy. Um, and obviously sustaining that economic contribution is contingent on being able to manage any potential environmental impacts. So this map over here on the right hand side shows you the distribution of all the different active mines at the moment across Australia. So you can see not only is this a big challenge for Australia, given the number of uh, different operational mines we have at the moment and the contribution uh, to our economy. So mining accounts for about 10% of our gross domestic product and about 50% of our total export earnings. But it's a particular challenge for Western Australia. So mining in Western Australia accounts for around 30% of our gross state product and 90% of all of our export earnings. And again, if we focus in on WA over here, you can see just the sheer number of mines that we have operational across our state. A lot of those are iron ore mines up in the Pilbara region. Um, we have a diversity of different uh, products that we uh, extract, very mineral and resource rich state. The extraction of all of these different resources come with different kinds of impacts, um, and that's related to both the way in which these resources occur in the ground and how we extract and refine those materials into saleable products for market. But regardless, there's a couple of major steps that we go through in the extraction of any mineral or energy resource. And so I've just prepared a fairly simple diagram um, for those of you who've never been to a mine site or haven't thought much about mining before to explain the generation of some of these different sources um, of waste and byproducts. So this is showing uh, an open cut pit. Um, so the kind of uh, pit that, for example, the Kalgoorlie super pit might be one that you might be familiar with essentially digging a large open hole in the ground to get down to whichever resource we want to extract. Sometimes we use underground workings, either when we've gotten to a point in the open cut pit where we want to extract a deeper part of the resource or just straight down from the surface in some cases. Regardless of the mode of extraction, we usually uh, get this rock um, and uh, start hauling it out of that mine pit. And this is where our first source of uh, mine waste and byproducts is generated. We'll go through an initial sorting stage. So sorting out some of this material that sits over the top. So things like the soil near the surface and what we call overburden, kind of a layer sitting between a nice topsoil at the very surface and our mineralized zone containing a resource down the bottom. We move the topsoil out of the way and we usually store it because we want to use that later for rehabilitation during mine closure. The waste rock, on the other hand, is basically the material that we've extracted that's too low in concentration for us to bother processing it further. It's just not economically viable to do so. Some photos of what this looks like. This is a coal mine site uh, in the UK. And so you can see here uh, what an open cut pit can look like, a larger zoomed out image at the top. And you can see this topsoil layer, that nice brownie coloured material at the surface, which is supporting uh, that nice bit of the forest in the background. Um, then the overburden sitting in these upper layers here, uh, which is not uh, the, the target for what we're trying to extract. Once we've mined our ore and we've separated out the waste rock from the material that we actually want to process and purify so that we can create a high value product for the market, we take it up and we usually process it further through a number of different steps. These can be physical or chemical in nature or a little bit of both. So we crush it to reduce the particle size, um, and improve the uh, extraction overall, uh, as well as the speed, or we can do some chemical processes. So introducing that ore uh, into a solution to extract various components. We can also do something like smelting. So heating the ore up to a very high temperature and adding in some other components as well so that we can separate out just the material we're after. Um, so that kind of process is used, for example, in copper production. Along the way, we generate two more uh, main types of products here. So one is the waste water. So any water, for example, that we've used in that uh, refining process or during crushing to wash out uh, things we're not uh, looking for in the um, final product. And then also solid residues. Uh, and these we refer to as tailings. These were all the leftovers um, that were present in the ore that we brought up from the pit um, that once we put through uh, the new processing, we didn't want to have uh, going into our product out to the market. So for kinds of uh, mine waste and byproducts that we produce. And each of these have different, uh, oh, just a couple of photos here uh, of what some of the tailing storage areas can look like. So again, covering big um, areas of land surface, 
uh, and obviously posing a pretty interesting challenge when it comes time to finish mining uh, and return that uh, area to a new end land use. So each of these materials comes with slightly different properties and don't worry too much about the detail here, but this is just to show that a lot of these are at extremes of pH, so either very acid or very alkaline, they can often be salty and they often don't have a lot of organic carbon content. Um, often they can be quite high in uh, available metals as well. And all of these are real challenges when it comes time, as I just mentioned, to remediate and close our sites. I'm going to walk through a couple of photos just quickly uh, of some areas around the Mount Morgan uh, mine site. Um, and then I'm going to loop back to what we do about these tailings materials in particular. Um, I'm going to focus in on tailings because we produce about 7 billion tonnes of tailings globally each year. Um, you can see an example of some of these down the bottom here. Um, and they pose a massive challenge for uh, closure uh, when it comes time to finish uh, mining and refining operations. As I've said, regardless of the resource that they're extracted from, they share some common properties. So we see extremes of pH, high salinity, not much soil structure, no organic matter or nutrients, and they either have a very fine or a very coarse particle size. So really not like uh, natural soils um, that you'd see, for example, in your backyard at all. And part of our challenge is to figure out how do we transform these materials so that they do become uh, functional soils. A couple of aerial photos of the Mount Morgan mine site that we saw that photo of at the beginning of the talk. And I wanted to show this view to give you an idea of the spatial area that these kinds of um, facilities can occupy. So you can see the scale depth bar down here uh, at the bottom. This is an area of about two by three uh, kilometres that it occupies. And this area here is the open cut pit um, where the copper and gold ore was extracted that now has filled up with water through rainfall over time. Down here, you can see some of the waste rock storage areas, some of the tailing storage areas are up here, um, and some more waste rock and tailing storage areas over there, as well as the refinery site uh, in the middle. And so given that this site was operating for about 100 years, it's pretty interesting to see that so little rehabilitation um, has been done. So this is a view out into that open cut pit. It holds about 12,000 megalitres of water, sitting at a pH of three. Um, and um, that might not mean much to, to most people, but that's basically sitting there at the pH of lemon juice. So if you can imagine um, any animals or wildlife trying to access that water, if you can imagine that water escaping out into the Dee River nearby, you can understand that that would cause some pretty significant impact. It's so acidic because of the oxidation of pyrite. So in this ore, um, in this area um, around the mine site, um, the copper ore co-occurred with this mineral that we call pyrite or iron sulfide. And when that's exposed to oxygen, as you can uh, imagine is hanging around the atmosphere there, um, and with some rainfall to supply the water, you get rapid oxidation of that pyrite and it generates sulfuric acid. And that is the process that has acidified this huge body of water here and is posing a really big challenge for remediation and closure. One of the strategies that's been tested is to use these evaporators. So essentially sucking up the uh, acid mine drainage and spraying it back over the site to try and reduce the volume uh, of water that's sitting there. Uh, another is uh, injecting lime uh, into the water to help neutralize the pH. Um, about $40 million has been spent on rehabilitation uh, so far, um, and it's definitely still got a long, long way to go in terms of treating the sheer volume of water that's sitting here. So this highlights one of the great challenges in that we need to come up with low cost, um, fast ways to remediate these materials. Some more views across the site here, so you can see um, really clear erosion in the background from slopes that are quite steep, um, that haven't had much vegetation establishment, um, and that continue to feed new material uh, into that pit. You can see some of the piles of slag from the uh, copper smelter here as well. Uh, and here you can see some of the tailings that's being stored on the other side of this wall, seeping out and into one of the other water storage areas. So as I said, really big long-term issues at this site um, that continue to persist. I mentioned before about 7 billion tonnes of tailings that are produced globally each year. And obviously um, the amount of tailings depends on the total production of the ore, as well as the quality of that ore and how the different ores are processed. And so you can see on the right hand side here, some numbers around how much tailings 
uh, some different commodities produce. So the chemical and physical properties of these tailings is a bit different depending uh, on which commodity they come from. But we can break some of them into some groups and by doing that, we can start to identify uh, some common properties that we can use to develop remediation strategies for these. Um, so one strategy, for example, uh, that we've been working on is uh, aiming to treat the alkaline pH in about 25% uh, of the tailings produced worldwide. Regardless of the byproduct or tailings material, waste rock, uh, whatever you want to class under this, uh, produced, we tend to apply this byproduct remediation, sorry, management hierarchy. So to write down the bottom is discharge. We don't want to be just discharging these materials uh, unremediated into the surrounding environment. The next tier up is containment. So simply confining and controlling uh, any potential releases of those tailings and mine, mine waste. Next tier up is remediation. So what can we do to actually change uh, some of those hazardous properties uh, of the tailings so that even if they are released, they're not going to cause any issues to surrounding environments? And how can we safely close uh, these tailing storage areas? Reuse. So what can we do to um, create some other opportunities so that we can feed these in as raw materials for other uh, processes. And finally, the lofty goal of zero waste. So this is a bit of a moonshot, requires a lot of thinking about how we redesign our mineral extraction processes, and it requires a lot of effort um, from engineers, from environmental scientists, from materials chemists, all kinds of different expertise to feed into that. Although this is a little bit of a way away, UWA is definitely um, working on trying to achieve this. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick plug for an event that we're organising in about a month's time um, called Three Steps to an Affordable Zero Waste Mine. We're organising this in collaboration with the Public Policy Institute and the Minerals Research Institute of Western Australia. We're going to have a panel discussion looking at this issue from all different angles. So from the mining sector, from the regulators perspective, from non-government organisations, from research and development, and try and understand where are those opportunities to make this a reality. So we've mostly been focused on these three levels here at the moment. Like I said, zero waste is still a long way off. We have made some good progress um, in these three levels here. And what I want to give you is an example of one of the projects that I've been leading that has gone from this level down here, containment, and now is working towards developing strategies to empower reuse. So we've been answering three main questions here. Number one, how can we make containment safer? Number two, how can we make remediation faster, cheaper, and achieve better post-closure outcomes? And number three, what are the opportunities for reuse and how do we um, develop these new materials and markets for them? This is an aerial photo of a bauxite residue deposit in Ireland. Um, and uh, bauxite residue and its management is quite important to Western Australia. We're one of the world's biggest producers of bauxite and alumina products. Um, the challenge with this material is that it's quite alkaline and it's quite salty. And so as you can imagine, when it comes time to close and remediate these deposits, it can be a real challenge to get plants um, and animals to come on site and get that ecosystem started. So what our remediation strategies have been focusing on is understanding how we can accelerate that process. This is a photo of a site, a bauxite residue storage area in Guyana in South America. It had been left for about 40 years um, with no treatments applied whatsoever. And when I visited uh, in about 2010, we noticed that this vegetation cover had naturally started to recruit onto the site. And that was really interesting because it told us that the tailings could almost remediate itself. It just needed a really long time. And so obviously when we're trying to close a site, we don't have the luxury of time on our hands. We wanna be able to do it as quickly as possible. What we did is we studied the properties in the vegetated and non-vegetated areas of this site and indeed about 10 other uh, sites that have received different kinds of amendments all around the world to understand what were the critical factors that impeded or enhanced remediation and vegetation growth. So in other words, what were the treatments that we could apply to decrease pH and reduce that alkalinity and get rid of all the salt. And what we saw were that in areas with high rainfall um, and areas where physical amendments had been applied, we saw a rapid decrease in salt. When we applied chemical amendments and in areas where there'd been a good atmospheric carbonation, we saw a decrease in pH. 
And so combining those two together, where we saw all of those acting, we had the best remediation outcomes because they were addressing the pH and the salt at the same time. But what we started to suspect was that microbes could play a role as well. No one had really looked at the biology of these deposits. And what we saw by doing some uh, work at another set of sites and starting to characterise the microbial community was that in fact, we saw hints that microbes were helping to neutralise pH very rapidly by using organic matter that had been supplied. There was also some evidence that they could help fixing the carbon dioxide and reducing pH as well. And so based on that observation, we set about a package of work designed to um, essentially generate uh, acids in situ with those microbes. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the beer brewing process, this is pretty much it, right? You feed them some glucose, you feed the yeast some glucose, and they produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. The process that we tried to do here is more or less similar, except we want them to produce acid rather than the alcohol. And by adding a little bit of soil, by giving them some glucose as their food source, um, and introducing all that into the bauxite residue, we were able to come up with a treatment that rapidly decreased the pH of this material. We could also see physical changes. So you notice this suspension uh, before the treatment and after the treatment, you can see how clear that solution has become. And that's because all those fine particles have agglomerated and dropped out of solution. So we've improved the structure as well. After we'd tested that at the lab in little uh, vials containing about three or four grams of the bauxite residue, we started to scale up. So the first scale up was to glass house, um, where we uh, neutralized about 30 kilos of bauxite residue at a time. And what we did here is we tested this microbial treatment as a way of producing acids and carbon dioxide with some of the other treatments that we'd seen in that previous field work um, that enhanced remediation as well. So adding organic matter, adding irrigation to simulate the higher rainfall environments, using tillage to create structure and help with leaching, and adding gypsum as well to stabilise the structure and decrease pH. And this combination was a highly successful approach for driving rapid pH neutralisation as well as uh, salt removal through leaching from this material. From these glasshouse trials, we've now set up a medium scale field trial uh, here in Western Australia, and we continue to work with the alumina companies to further develop this approach. Our next stage, we'll be looking at putting plants on and how we can then build up the ecosystem complexity further from there. And what we're also considering as well is how this approach for remediation of tailings is going to potentially empower new reuse avenues as well. So at larger field scale, what we're considering is adding all of these amendments at the surface, mixing them in, and then periodically going back and harvesting the treated residue. By being very careful about which kinds of uh, amendments we add into the residue, we could tailor the composition uh, of this soil product and open up a whole new range of reuse opportunities. And what we would potentially be able to do would be treat a layer towards the top of a deposit, remove it, treat the next layer, remove it, and treat the next layer and remove it. And so in this way, the strategy that we've developed for remediation would actually empower reuse and uh, removal of these tailing storage facilities over the long term. I'm just gonna quickly showcase some other UWA research in this area um, that is uh, part of this overall picture of improving environmental outcomes associated with mining. The first um, is looking at how do we improve revegetation outcomes, uh, focusing more on the plants rather than the soil part. Australian native species are really challenging. Um, anyone who's tried growing in the, them in their garden will know how tricky they can be and how fussy they can be, and certainly rehabilitation, that's no different at all. These are some photos from up in the Pilbara, um, big iron ore uh, mining regions where some of the trials are going on at the moment. Todd and uh, Andrew have focused in on key species here that are challenging to revegetation. Um, and by understanding at a very detailed level their seed morphology, they've identified new treatments to enhance revegetation. So you can see uh, one of the seeds of their uh, focus species here has this fuzzy coat and these um, legs out the end. What they've done is designed and uh, engineered a flash flaming tool that burns all of that material off. And not only does this improve germination success so the number of seeds that germinate, but it makes it easier to spread across the site as well. So you get more vegetation, more easily, evenly spread across your site. This was such a breakthrough and has had such success in improving revegetation uh, outcomes up there that it actually won the 2016 Western Australia Innovator of the Year Award uh, in the Emerging Innovation category. As I said, Andrew and Todd are leading this project, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about this approach. 
another area is around <coughs> improving our understanding of uh, end pit lake uh, chemistry and uh, physical properties so that we can intervene before some of those issues like the acid mine drainage at Mount Morgan that I mentioned before become an issue. The approach that Carolyn and Matt have used to address this is by going out and collecting very detailed uh, field data using these long sensors that they've installed across the lakes to create a detailed understanding of the chemical and physical properties of these water bodies, model inflows and outflows, and create a detailed computer model so that they can predict when things might go wrong. By being aware of when things might go wrong, they can then intervene before they do go wrong. Again, Carolyn and Matt leading this project, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about that. Finally, completion criteria. So much like in football, we need to know where the goalposts are if we're going to actually uh, score. Completion criteria in mining talk, are talking about agreed standards or levels of performance which demonstrate the successful closure of a site. So during rehabilitation, we need to know what are the uh, key targets that we want to hit so that we can wrap up our work here. These completion criteria are not easy to define in practice. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of variation on a site by site basis. Um, and there wasn't any clear guidance for how a company should do this. Often people would just borrow completion criteria from each other and they'd be applying them to totally different ecosystems uh, or parts of the state. And so what Marit and Anna did with, as part of a larger team was go through a big consultative process with a lot of mining companies, government regulators, community groups and university partners and come up with a detailed framework, only a small part of which is shown on the right hand side here to improve. Um, that guidance on how people could develop criteria that were appropriate for their sites. Again, Marit and Anna, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have on those. A couple of other projects that UWA uh, is involved in. So one's a cooperative research centre for transformations in mining economies. This was announced early this year. Uh, it's a 10 year partnership with $130 million of uh, research support uh, across all of these different partners being contributed. Um, and this is really focused on figuring out how we can, early in, life, in the life of mine, be able to design uh, strategies so that our communities are left with positive economic and environmental legacies after mine closure. We're also involved in training the workforce of the future. So I mentioned that field trip uh, right back at the start of my talk. Uh, these are some other photos from that trip. So going around various different uh, sites in southwest Western Australia. We also try um, not only to get people to talk to the mine staff on site, who have been very generous in sharing their expertise with us. We get them to collect samples, um, both in the field uh, and process samples in the labs so that they have really detailed understanding of the kinds of materials that you find at mine sites and what can be done to remediate uh, and reuse them. A quick plug for our Master of Environmental Science. We have an environmental rehabilitation specialization within this program. Um, and the specialisation, the specialisation itself is broad, so we look at urban mining um, and other environments. But within that, there's a couple of units for any of you who might be interested uh, in training and development opportunities that are particularly relevant to the mining industry. And of course, I'd be happy to take uh, questions or emails from anyone who's interested in enrolling in those. And with that, I will wrap up and hand back to Sam to go through any Q&A. Again, anyone who's interested in coming along to that event, please register your interest at that email address. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Talitha. That was such an interesting talk. We've had loads of questions come through. Um, so I'm just going to pick a couple for you to, to get going with, if that's OK. Sure. This first question is from Fran. And um, this is what, something I was thinking of as well. So it's how long does it take for waste material to become functional enough to support flora and fauna in, in that environment? That's a really good question. So like I said, in Guyana and South America, we were seeing that it took about 40 years and that was in the do nothing case, right? Um, we've seen similar sorts of timeframes for gold tailings. Um, there was a nice study a while ago of some gold tailings in Canada. Uh, that took about 40 or 50 years before we were seeing some nice vegetation come onto site without any amendments. What we're trying to do here is compress that timeframe to five years. Um, if we can get it shorter than that, that would be fantastic. Um, so far, we've had really good success with that uh, treatment that I, I talked about for bauxite residue. Um, we're definitely compressing the soils part of it um, to one to two years. Uh, and the next challenge is to then compress the vegetation um, and developing those more complex ecosystems into a two to three uh, year timeframe. 
Perfect. And yeah, just to remind everyone, if you want to ask questions, just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your um, Zoom window. A uh, question here from John. So John says that zero waste is obviously an ideal, but if we were able to remediate and reuse everything instead, would that still have an observably positive impact on the local environment? Absolutely. Yeah, especially if we're able to use strategies like the one that I discussed to draw down any reserves of those byproduct materials that we might have at mine sites and eventually remove them from the um, local landscape altogether. That would definitely be the ideal. If we can remediate and turn that part of the landscape um, with the byproducts still stored um, to a productive um, end land use, then that's definitely a great outcome as well. Um, so I don't think, you know, zero waste, although it's the ideal, isn't always necessary in no. order to have a positive post-mining outcome. No, absolutely. And a question here from Alicia who says, does anything need to be done to maintain the top soil while it is stored? Yes, there has been a lot of work done around topsoil management. Um, in the earlier days of mining, people would not really think about it much at all and scrape it off um, and mix it with the overburden and, you know, not give it any special treatment at all. And once people realised how valuable topsoil is as part of uh, rehabilitation, it got treated much, much differently. Um, so now what we do is we try to do a thing called direct return, which is... Um, Obviously, as you go through your life of mine, you will open up a larger and larger part of that resource. Um, often you'll have opportunities to progressively rehabilitate as you continue to mine as well. And so what direct return is, is when you open up a new part of the mine, you want to try and return that topsoil immediately to a part of the mine that's being rehabilitated. That's the ideal. If that can't be done, then we try to store topsoil for as short a time as possible because its quality does degrade quickly. Great. We've got loads of questions coming in. So another one here from Todd. So Todd says, with the potential benefit of using soil microbes in this remediation space, e.g. for tailings, where is the research at? And crucially, is this scalable as well? Yeah, so the strategy that I presented, that's a great example of scaling up. So we started in the lab with three or four grams of residue. We went to the glass house where we were treating sort of 30 to 50 uh, kilograms at a time. And now we've scaled up to the field where we're treating 35 tonnes at a time. So that's a seven order of magnitude scale up. So we've been really, really pleased with how that's worked. And that's not the only example uh, either. There's some uh, really nice um, examples of inoculation onto seeds um, that have been successfully scaled up from laboratory through Glasshouse into the field as well. Um, what was the second part of the question? Just about, it was just about that exact question about scale, yeah. which, which right. you answered, yeah. perfect. So yeah. um, another question here from Kylie, I think this is quite important. Do we need innovation in repurposing to enhance adaptation and value or communication to educate more broadly? Yeah, these are some of the issues that we're going to cover um, in the three steps to an affordable zero waste mine event. So um, it's both of those. Um, and it's other factors as well. So it's looking at um, not only consumer attitudes, it's producer attitudes, how they can change their processes so that it might make it slightly um, easier to reuse or that we might open other opportunities for reuse. It's looking at the regulation. Um, it's looking at how we not only change policy to support this, um, but also how do we change various levies and economic incentives um, how do we address issues like freight? So that's a massive one, believe it or not. Trying to get these materials from where it's produced to where it could potentially be reused is really challenging. And some people have got great ideas about how we can backfill onto grain trains and things like that. So it's a whole bunch of different factors. And we're trying to figure out some solutions. Where are the opportunities as part of this event uh, up on the right hand side? Excellent. And a question here from Celeste, I think, which kind of um, backs onto that is what ex to what extent do you think the minds are actually willing to to engage in, in these conversations themselves and the the responsibilities that they identify as having yeah very willing i've been um very pleased with how supportive how engaged how interested uh, most mining companies are with um, figuring out ways to reduce the environmental impacts of mining um, and i think that's because as i pointed out at the start of my talk uh, mining companies know that they have to be managing their environmental impacts um, as best they can if they want to continue to operate. 
Um, so not only from a regulatory perspective, there are of course avenues for governments to step in and revoke licences um, if environmental um, management measures aren't appropriate or aren't achieving their aims. Uh, but it's also from a public perspective uh, as well. Um, so I mean, they know that their social licence to operate is so important, being welcomed as part of local communities um, who are often keeping an eye on those environmental mm. impacts. So yeah, with that in mind, I've um, had very supportive uh, interactions with mining companies on these topics. That's really good to know. I mean, I think you've definitely inspired some people to be thinking outside the box here. So a question here from Stephen uh, on this issue of um, repurposing. The acidic lake was primarily acidified by the production of sulfuric acid. He, he thinks that's what you said. Yep, could correct. this be could this be used as a starting material to be used in the manufacture of fertilizers? And has anybody thought about doing this? It's also used in dyes, pigment production, and some explosives, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So um, spot on. It, it definitely is. The challenge that we have at the moment, and that there has has been and continues to be a lot of work on is how to separate out some of those other components as well. So I didn't go into this just for the sake of time, but um, when you have that pyrite oxidizing, you often, I wrote it there as a pure mineral, but it's often not. It often has copper, cadmium, all kinds of other elements mixed into it. And so when the pyrite oxidizes, not only does it generate the sulfuric acid, but it releases the iron, it releases those other elements as well. And so that water is a soup of different elements. Um, to be able to use uh, sulfuric acid for some of those applications, you actually need a pretty high quality product. So the challenge is how do we purify that acid um, or can we find some applications which are less demanding on purity so that we could reuse it for those sorts of purposes. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one last question. This is from Francis. Um, and this is just, what is the evidence around the impacts of decreasing mine wastes on environmental assets? Are there, for example, biodiversity measures or other signals that indicate recovery or no harm? Sure. So I'm going to assume um, that that's uh, in relation to pre and post uh, remediation. Yeah. yeah, the monitoring schemes, um, there's some guidance uh, from the government, but the monitoring schemes are often proposed by the companies and then reviewed by the government um, so that they're appropriate to that site and its environmental context, as well as um, what is the end land use that you want it to support? So for example, are you trying to create a site that supports pasture or cropping or that would be used as a recreational area or any other um, sorts of land uses? So they're often, those monitoring schemes and the completion criteria are often tailored uh, to the site and its unique properties. Fantastic. All right, well, that's just about time for questions, uh, Talitha. So we'd just like to sincerely thank everyone who's attended today's session. A special thank you to Talitha for sharing such exciting research that her research group specialises in uh, and for figuratively at least taking us across the border to Queensland uh, to see what mine sites look like over there as well. And in, great to see some in the UK in that talk as well. If you've got any questions for Talitha, please do reach out to her uh, via email or via her Twitter handle there as well. And we look forward to seeing you all next week for some more science exchanges. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>